Aloha, everyone. It's, it's always a pleasure to be on your campus, and on behalf of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation, our mission, as I always tell you, is really each and every one of you, because we hope that you are going to be the future of the culinary industry in Hawaii. I want to congratulate all of you that were involved in the special events dinner that you did in December, your instructors as well. I attended that, and it was simply outstanding, uh, world class as any nice as any restaurant in in the country, so congratulations to all of you on that dinner. It's been my dream uh, in the last year, and since I met Melissa Miranda, to have her come to your campus, because I really was just blown away by what she taught the students at Capilani Community College about a year ago. Chef Melissa Miranda is from Seattle, Washington, and she is uh, the chef owner of Musang Restaurant, and uh, the restaurant's been, uh, is really in its infancy, but she's already garnered national attention. This year being nominated for a uh, James Beard semifinalist, as well as last year. And Melissa is, here's her photograph in Food and Wine Magazine. And she was recognized in 2022 uh, as one of outstanding uh, chefs, uh, young chefs that are coming up in the industry. Phenomenal recognition and well-deserved for her restaurant. It's based on childhood memory. She's going to tell you about that and about her family and Filipinx food. And this, there's been students working all day today with her in the kitchen, uh, getting ready for today's demonstration and to treat all of you to uh, a taste of Filipinx food and her philosophy, uh, which is outstanding as well as what, how she approaches the culinary industry and how she involves her team in directing the culinary industry moving forward. So it's my pleasure and honor to have with us today, and she's made time from an incredibly busy schedule, Chef Melissa Miranda. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. Am I mic'd? No? The, oh, I am. Oh gosh. Hi! Thanks for having me. Um, there are a lot of you. <laughs> uh, I will try and make eye contact as I go through the room. Um, I will try not to be awkward and shy, but um, thank you Haley for having me. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here um, with you guys. Um, I too attended culinary school many years ago, um, and it's really great to see your faces here. I know that this might seem like a long journey, or uh, what you're learning is just something you might already know, but in the long run, and each phase and each semester of what you guys go through really, really adds to the knowledge and growth of who you will become, either as a chef, or as an owner, or as a leader, or a mentor. So, don't take each step uh, lightly. Um, try and be present with most of it because all of that stuff is going to be rewarded in the end. But I'm gonna do a slideshow. Um, it's kind of corny, but uh, it'll be a little bit about myself. Um, and then I'm gonna movie magic some food for you guys because we don't have much time. Um, but like Haley said, my name is Melissa. Um, I own a restaurant in Beacon Hill. Um, and we talk about reliving childhood memories through Filipino food. Um, do we have Filipinos in the room today? Yes, yes, yes. Um, a big part, too, of why I'm here um, is for representation. Um, I think Hawaii, as most of you guys know, there are a lot of Filipinos that exist on this island, that work in um, the industry on this island. and. Uh, they are very talented cooks. The food is incredible. Um, you know, Chef Sheldon is a, is a mentor of mine. Um, but I think it's important for you all to be able to see one, a Filipina and a Filipino woman doing what it is that we're doing um, in an industry that uh, sometimes we don't get that recognition that we work so hard for. So um, just to let you guys know that it's possible. Um, and it's possible doing it in a way that is authentic to yourselves. Um, so yeah. When it comes to Filipino food or just food in general, I think oftentimes uh, there's a lot of criticism or criticalness of how you cook your food. So if I cook chicken adobo, it's probably not going to be the same as your Lola's or your mom's or your auntie's and you're going to judge me. So the way we approach Filipino food um, is through what I grew up eating or what my team grew up eating. So um, there's this kind of flexibility in how you can uh, 
interpret the food. We're not trying to be literal, um, but we're trying to be creative. Uh, because we're in Seattle, we're very seasonal, so we don't have the product like you guys have here or the accessibility. Um, we cook Filipino through food through seasons. Um, and it's really cool, because my grandparents get to try laing, for example, which is a taro leaf dish with coconut. Um, but instead of taro leaf, which we can't get, you're gonna have it with kale and collards. Um, and so we get to kind of twist things around um, and make things taste delicious. But I'm gonna click through. Um, who am I? <laughs> I am Seattle born, raised Filipina. Um, I actually went to the University of Washington uh, and I graduated with a degree in sociology. Uh, when I was in college, I actually um, studied abroad uh, and I studied in Italy and I studied in London. Um, and then after I graduated, I ended up going to culinary school in Italy. Uh, so I lived in Italy for about six years, went to school, learned the language, kind of hung out and lived my best life, uh, and then I got serious. <laughs> uh, after that, I moved to New York, um, and I cooked in New York for a couple of years, um, but my family is in Seattle, and so I came back. Um, when it comes to how I describe myself, um, I think that I see myself more than just a chef. Um, I think that's also possible for all of you. Um, I think of myself as a community leader and organizer. Um, it's really important to be able to have a platform where you can share your story as well as your food. Um, we do a lot of fundraising, we do a lot of community work. Uh, when Musang opened, we opened right before the pandemic. So we opened January of 2020. Um, and we thought the world was gonna be different. And for three months we were jam-packed doing what we thought we loved. Uh, and then we had to close down and we turned our kitchen into a community kitchen. Um, and so for three months we operated um, serving up to 200 meals a day, just me and my sous chef, um, all donated, um, just to make sure that the families in our community were fed. Because uh, that's important. If you feed your community, and support your community, your, support, your community will support you. Um, I'm someone that truly loves Filipino food and being able to support and uplift our people and give them an avenue and a way to explore um, how they cook and eat food. And um, that's me. Uh, <laughs> it's me as a kid in the kitchen and then that's me. Um, we do a lot of videos and video content um, in Seattle. Uh, I do Bon Appetit videos as well. Um, and so it's a way for us to share food, like Filipino food that has never been on that platform before. Uh, JP is Filipino born. Um, he's one of my sous chefs at the restaurant and he is amazing. Um, one thing as a chef and an owner, for me it's important that you get to know the faces behind the food that you make. It's not just about me, it's about the people. Um, things that my mom would be proud of, uh, graduating school, because that was hard. Uh, I started working at Bon Appetit magazine, um, and I think for her, I think it's hard growing up as a Filipina, uh, child of a Filipino immigrant, um, the expectations of who we need to be and what we need to be are quite high. Um, and I think her being able to see <laughs> my face in a magazine made it real for her that what we're doing is real. Um, but you don't need that. I think just being able to show up and do what you love um, is more than enough. Um, seeing Filipino food represented on platforms she never dreamed of seeing. I think Filipino food growing up for myself, uh, I never saw anyone that looked like me doing this kind of food, um, even just in the chef world, you know, we had Martin Yang uh, on KCTS, who was the only Chinese chef that you would see on TV. Everyone else was not this color. Um, and so I think for this generation to know that uh, you can and your food can make it um, is very important. Um, I did a TED Talk. Um, that's really hard. If you don't know what a TED Talk is, it's memorizing like 15 minutes of something that you're really passionate about. Um, and I didn't make a mistake, so I think my mom would be <laughs> proud of that. That's the magazine, um, In Bon Appetit, which is super cool. This is our version of Punset. Um, these are some videos on Bon Appetit that I've done. Uh, adobong Puset Punset is a squid ink adobo dish. 
Um, we do crab and coconut milk uh, with bagaong. Um, so it's really cool to see these things and like the ingredients in these words um, in places that you never thought you'd see. Um, beyond me, there's a restaurant called Musang. Um, we run a community kitchen program. We're connected to local organizations. Um, I love to box. Um, I think it's important to have hobbies outside of cooking. Cooking can be your passion and it can be your job, um, but make sure you to create your identity out of yourself too so you can find that balance. Um, I think that's something that I've been really working on as a chef and encouraging my team to be able to find who they are outside of work. Um, because work is where they can come and show up, but if you're not showing up for yourself, how can you show up for work? So, boxing is one way. Um, I love to karaoke, and I don't really like to be called chef. For me and my team, we really like to acknowledge um, who we are as a person and be able to know and remember each other's names and how we show up into spaces. So, um, so today we're gonna do three different dishes. Um, I know that seems like a lot. We don't have much time, but we're gonna movie magic this stuff. Um, you guys have recipes to the dishes that we're gonna be making. Um, I've spent time with uh, six students today for about five hours, just kind of going through these recipes, sharing my time, sharing stories, um, and so that you guys can have a taste of these foods um, in just a little bit. Um, but these three are some of my favorite ones. Um, the first dish is called inaloban na ista. Uh, inaloban is a dish that you can find in southern, in the southern Philippines. If you don't know, the Philippines is the Philippines are comprised of thousands of islands. Uh, there's the north end, and then there's the south end, um, where in the south part of the islands you will find more spicy food, use of turmeric, use of coconut milk, um, and that's what's been inspired by this dish. Um, the ingredients are <laughs> here. We've kind of done a little chopping up for you guys, but we've got garlic, turmeric, lemongrass, and ginger. Um, very fragrant, very aromatic. Um, once you've got this like this, it turns into this. Uh, we food process everything, um, and then we cook everything down. So one thing about owning a restaurant, and as you guys learn, um, the foundations of the restaurant are always either built with your sauces, or the importance of a saucier, um, being able to taste things as you go, um, that's important. So at our restaurant, Mondays and Tuesdays um, are big, heavy sauce prep days. Um, Filipino food is a lot of sauces, adobo, afritada, kare kare. Um, what else is there? There's so many that I'm forgetting now because I'm nervous. Um, but everything is based off that. So I'm just gonna show you some of the sauces. Um, we'll go ahead and start here. Um, the first, I'm gonna skip to Sharshadong Isda. So that's the last recipe on your ingredients things. Um, Sharshado is inspired by um, the Spanish, which came and colonized the Philippines. So there's a lot of influence of Spanish cuisine. Sarsa means sauce, sarsado, sauce. Um, I grew up eating this dish. My dad, um, he used to go fishing every summer, fry whole fishes. Um, and then this would be the sauce that he would make for the fish. That's okay, thank you. So this is really simple. You can make this at home. Your parents might really love you for it. Um, today we're gonna serve it with a fried uh, hamachi collar. So um, if you guys have anything that's like extra scraps, little fried you know, fish scraps, this would be really great to do. Um, so I've got some garlic here. We're cooking the garlic first um, so that we can really get that garlic flavor in the oil. If you've had Filipino food before, there is no lack of garlic. If you've been to a Filipino house before, that's probably the first thing that you smell. Um, and for me, it's like a very welcoming smell. When you come into our restaurant, it smells like what you're about to smell here in a little bit. Um, we're gonna season it with a little bit of salt. And the salt helps um, take out the moisture and helps you uh, get more flavor. It's gonna caramelize.
Uh, make sure since the garlic is going first before the onions, which you'll find, um, you don't want to burn the garlic, so you got to watch it. And then once you start to see a couple pieces of the garlic to brown, I'm going to add my onions. Adding the onions after is going to help prevent the garlic from burning. But you're still going to be able to cook and taste that flavor of the garlic. It's looking a little dry. <laughs> Um, a little bit more salt. Season as you go. I think that's one thing that I learned. It's very important. When you're following a recipe, it's great. But if you add all the salt at the very end, it's not going to taste great because you're only just going to get salt at the front of your mouth. When you taste and you salt and you season as you go, you're building flavors, right? That's important. Because if you add salt along the way, by the end, you won't need to add salt because everything that you've added in there with love and care has flavor. So earlier today with the team, I just made them taste the garlic and the onions. And they were like, wow, I can't believe it tastes like this. When you start to taste your ingredients at the steps and you start to know, um, you'll be able to create menus, right? You can be able to create different ideas. Um, you can start reinterpreting, like reinterpreting dishes. So these are onions are getting translucent. Water is coming out. It's very steamy. You guys can't really see, but I'll just explain. <laughs> and then I've got tomatoes. This is a very seasonal dish. Um, in Seattle, we serve this dish. Uh, in the summertime at the restaurant. So the beauty of what we do at Misong as well, we change our menu every three months. Super important because you get to keep people coming into your restaurant because they're like, oh, I went last summer and now it's fall and then they get to try a whole new menu. Um, and then we get a lot of regulars coming back that way. It also helps with the creativity of the team. So I'm not the only one making recipes for the restaurant. We do things collaboratively. Um, a lot of my team has been with me since the very beginning of the pandemic. And so at this point, they're really excited. They know what we cook. They know what people like. So the challenge is always like, can I get a dish on the menu uh, this quarter? Um, and it's exciting. I think one of the things growing up as a young chef a lot of what we did was just following, saying yes, chef, not having the ability to create, create things or learn your own palate. Um, but it's very important that you begin to taste and learn your palate and add some water. Huh? Okay. You guys doing okay? Okay. <laughs> How does it smell? It smells good? Okay. So, so far in here we only have garlic, onion, tomato, salt, pepper. I'm going to add some fish sauce. Fish sauce is the magic. Um, they also have vegan fish sauce if you're vegan. It's made out of pineapple. You can find it on Amazon. It's actually really delicious. Um, in our restaurant we do a lot of vegan cooking vegetarian cooking, um, which is pretty trendy. And <laughs> it's being Filipino, that's very hard to do uh, vegetarian and vegan food. Um, but it's really important for us to be able to do that. Um, so you can find ingredients. All right. So I'm just going to cook this down. I'm going to uh, mash my tomatoes down a bit. I don't want this sauce to be dry. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more liquidy, and you'll see as it cooks down. All right. We'll let that cool kind of cook around the side while I do this one. <laughs> All right. So going back to Inaloban, first page, turmeric, lemon, ginger, garlic, 
lemongrass. Aromatics are in here. The importance of these aromatics, especially when it comes to lemongrass. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> when it comes to lemongrass and turmeric, these things are super fibrous. You guys are gonna come across this as you start cooking more, but you really wanna make sure that you cook these down. Um, Cause if not, you get little strings in your mouth and when it's about food texture and balance and everything is important and it's the little things that you do throughout that really make everything count and your dish special. Uh, this dish I first had actually uh, when I went to the Philippines. Uh, my parents both grew up um, in Manila, which is the main island of the Philippines. Um, there's three different regions in the Philippines. Um, and for Tagalog cooking, that they say that's the more traditional style of food. Um, the majority of Filipinos here in uh, Hawaii are Ilocano. Um, so it's a different kind of food. They do, they do a lot of like funky fish bagaong, uh, where we'll do like fermented shrimp instead. Uh, in the south, we'll do more um, spicy foods. Um, but I got to travel in the Philippines for um, three months, and I got to try this dish and was just blown away because I never had had anything. Like my parents didn't grow up eating this. Um, and that's also something that's really cool for us while we're cooking because we don't get pigeonholed to just cook like the only things that you know. You can explore, you can do research, you can travel. There's a lot of like Italian influences, excuse me, in how we cook food too. So know that you have the freedom of expression, yeah? Okay, so we're gonna movie magic, movie magic. Uh, once it gets like this, you're gonna add rice wine vinegar. Um, the rice wine vinegar is gonna evaporate, add acidity. Um, and then you're going to add Maggi. If you haven't had Maggi before, you should definitely try it. It is an incredible season enhancer. Um, you don't need too much. A little goes a long way. I'm going to add it here. I'm going to do a little dash in there. And then you're going to movie magic this. And it's going to turn into this. <laughs> uh, you're going to add coconut. You add cream. You mix it together and you blend it in the Vitamix. Um, this flavor here, which you guys are going to try, which I'm very excited about, um, is very rich in uh, the fattiness of the coconut milk, uh, the turmeric. Um, and then if you feel adventurous, you can add Thai chilies now because um, it's very similar to a curry. Or you can add it as a garnish so you have the flexibility to, to see what to do. OK, that's done. Our sauce we prepare on Mondays and Tuesdays gets held like this. Uh, and then we get to butcher fish. And you get to decide what fish you want to have. Move this guy over here for later. Um, today, the team got to um, butcher some beautiful Hawaiian fish. They were really large. Um, they got to practice their filleting skills, um, which you guys will get into. Uh, and don't be afraid, even if you make a mistake. It's good to practice. Um, but we decided to use pow, pow, pow. No, was the fish? Uhu, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uhu. Um, butchered it down. It's on a banana leaf, um, and they're in little bite sized pieces for you all to try. This sauce is put on top, um, and we grill it. Um, and it just becomes very creamy and delicious uh, and exciting. Um, so if you have the recipe, you can try it at home. <laughs> I'll put this away. They're going to cook that for you guys. Um, all right, so we're back to Charchado. You guys still following me? OK. Camera is following me? Yeah, there you go. There, yes. OK, so you can see now, because there's no steam really, the, the tomatoes have broken down. Onion is translucent. Garlic's cooked all the way. It's still hot. Um, and so at this point right here, I'm actually going to add some egg. Um, 
You can temper the egg by adding some sauce to it. Tempering means to match the heat from here to here. Because if I just dump this in here, you're going to get scrambled eggs, and we don't want scrambled eggs. Um, so I have this off of heat right now. I'm going to temper the eggs a bit. And then I'm just going to stir it in slowly. So the sauce will thicken. This will help the sauce thicken. So you can kind of see the colors changing now. It's a brighter yellow. The heat that's still residual from the veggies in the pan are cooking the eggs, so you won't have raw eggs. And you're gonna say, oh my gosh, is that it? That's it. That's the sauce. It's super, super simple. Um, as a child, my dad would make this sauce. My mom and I would fight over this sauce because it was so good. Um, but I'm actually going to blend it up for you guys, um, and you'll see it that way as well. Um, and we're going to serve it with the hamachi collars. Um, the way we serve this at the restaurant is a fried um, pompano, which is a whole kind of like a perch or a snapper. Um, we serve it with the sauce blended uh, with a little fresh cherry tomato salad um, and scallions as well. Gosh. <laughs> I know. Don't blow out. Um, this machine is amazing. Do research, watch videos. Um, you can cook things just by using this because of the heat from the blender. It emulsifies. You can make a hollandaise from it. You can make a cold thing. There's just a lot of really cool tricks. But um, for, the, for the hamachi, here we are. Movie magic again. Uh, we have a fried hamachi collar. It's been dredged in uh, cornstarch and rice flour, uh, not mochiko. It's actually rice flour. Uh, mochiko, if you coat it with that, is going to become very like uh, mochi kind of texture. Um, instead, with the cornstarch and the rice flour, you get a much crispier collar. So you can see we fried this half an hour ago, and it's still pretty crispy. And the sauce is just going to go on top. So it's kind of silky, kind of beautiful. We've got some scallion curls. If I had tomatoes, that would be there right now. Some microgreens. And that's as simple as you can get, but delicious. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> Um, the last thing, because I think I have, yes, I'm doing good on time. I'm just going to show you quickly how we make our uh, Filipino paella. Uh, it's called arroz valenciana. You have the recipe there as well. Um, you cook the, the rice uh, like in a risotto style, so that's separate. And then you get to enjoy it with some seafood and things. All right, so we pre-cooked the rice for you so you don't have to uh, watch me stir for like 45 minutes because if you've made risotto before, <laughs> that's how long it takes. Um, you'll notice that it looks very different than risotto rice. Uh, the difference here for us versus an Italian risotto um, is that we're using glutinous rice and arborio rice. So the glutinous rice adds more creaminess to the dish. Um, and then there's coconut milk, which adds a lot of creaminess as well, and then gives you the flavors of Philippine cuisine that you're looking for. Inside, you have turmeric, onions, and garlic um, that we Vitamix together, so it gives you this nice, vibrant color. Um, and then this thing called annatto oil, so, or annatto powder. Uh, this, you can find this in Philippine grocery stores. We use this to make kare kare. 
Um, we use this to make um, a frittata, a menudo, um, but it adds a nice kind of nutty flavor and color to your dish. And that's the color that comes out. Um, so I'm gonna just put the rice in here. So if we were picking this up at the restaurant as a dish, right, pick up for service, this is what it would look like. <laughs> you'd have your par-cooked rice, and then you'd just smash your rice down. I added a little oil on the bottom because I wanna make sure that the rice on the bottom is going to be crispy. Um, if you've had paella before, um, it's known to have that crispy texture because you're cooking it on the fire. Um, and that's the best part that you get to scrape off. Um, in Philippine cuisine, it's called tutong. Uh, and you can find that in garlic rice as well. And that's the best too. Like if you can get that crispy layer on the bottom, it's a special treat. Uh, as the power goes higher, you'll hear it sizzle. Hopefully. Okay, there it is, yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna spread this evenly on the bottom of the pan. So it can get nice and crispy. Um, the arroz that we do um, at Musang is a, a seafood arroz. Um, so we use clams, you should just Pop it on here. This is the magic part. You're like, how is this gonna cook? Don't worry, we're gonna put it in the oven. <laughs> so this dish is like one of those beautiful bright dishes that you get in the summertime. Get to season the top a little bit. Get to add some red bell peppers. Get to add some green peas for color. I think it's important that you can eat food that looks beautiful to your eyes and it doesn't have to be, you know, overcooked and sad, but beautiful. All right, so this is the magic part. You leave it here, you get it crispy. The students run it to the kitchen and you stick it in the oven and then when it cooks, the clams open up the shrimp is pink and perfect, and then you have a summertime paella. But you see, if you can make the rice ahead of time, you can make this dish for your family. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh. um, you guys will get tasters of the food, so you will get to see that all of this stuff does make sense when you do try it. Um, yeah, these are just some of the dishes. like. Three dishes, super simple, but when you taste it, they're so flavorful. Um, and the beauty of how you interpret food, for me especially, what I've learned um, is that focusing on your ingredients, being simple and intentional with your product is gonna go a really, really long way. Um, and at Musang, I mean, we have aunties and uncles and titas and titos and lolas and grandparents that come in that are just so um, proud to be able to see their food elevated or seen in a different way than what they grew up eating. Um, and to know that you guys can do that too um, is great. I think they're gonna pass out food? No, yes. Would you tell what the name of your restaurant means? And oh yeah. And about your community. Yes. Driven focus and a little wild yes, yes, yes. Okay, so while they're passing out food, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so Musang, as Haley mentioned, Musang is the name of our restaurant. What does Musang mean? Um, Musang was actually a black Mustang that my dad drove when he first moved to the States. The T fell off, and so he became known as Musang. Um, Musang in Tagalog means a uh, wild cat. Um, and if you ever visit our website or check out our Instagram, there's this OG photo of my dad with an afro this big. Um, and that's who we named the restaurant after. Uh, my dad was the one that actually taught me how to cook Filipino food. Um, took me squidding, took me fishing. 
taught me how to cook food um, and the importance of being Filipino. Um, I think it's really easy to try and assimilate, but you can't forget your roots because that's where your heart is, you know? Um, but we are a community-driven restaurant, um, meaning it's not about me, it's about the team, and it's about the people and the stories. Um, we fo focus on the education of Filipino food because representation matters and our food deserves to be seen. So this is our house in Seattle, if you can see. Um, it used to be an old craftsman house. It's lavender color, so we call it the Ube house. Um, the whole point of it is to feel like you're walking into your aunt or uncle's or grandma's home. Um, it's inspired by these heritage homes in the north, um, in the Philippines. Um, and it's a place that's built for us, by us, where we can share our stories, art, and culture. Um, so the art that's featured in here are all Filipino artists. Um, Amelia is in the back there. She's waving. She actually painted the painting that's up there. Um, and it's very just representative of who we are and what we do. Uh, this is our outside space. Um, Seattle's cold, and so we need a place to eat outside. Um, our food is inspired by everywhere, um, and our menus really focus on using fresh ingredients, um, and they change every season. These are some of our dishes at the restaurant. Um, so you can see they're very bright and colorful um, and fresh. Um, our process is, uh, it's not your Lola's cooking, but it's authentic to us. Um, our memories and relationships to food guide us more than traditional recipes. And we like to do things collaboratively, um, which is very important. Um, this is our dinaguan. If you guys know what dinaguan is, on the uh, right-hand side, very different version. Uh, it's a brined pork chop, uh, Berkshire pork, uh, with the dinaguan sauce, which is blood uh, and tamarind. And then on the left-hand side is our beef machado, which is a beautiful stew. In the back, you can see that fish, the inalo bun in the corner, but just plated differently. This is our kare kare on the right-hand side, uh, and then our sinigang na ista on the left. So it doesn't maybe look like what you grew up eating, but the taste looks is going to be like how you ate it when you were younger. Um, and then finally, to close us out, I'm not going to make you listen to this. <laughs> but if you feel so inclined, um, this is the TED Talk that I did uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the TED Talk was about uh, how do you take care of your people um, in this restaurant industry. It's really hard. I'm sure your chefs have talked about it, but this industry isn't easy. Um, and there is a reason why I think they are so passionate in what they do and what they show and what they care for you, because we do need people that are great to stay in this industry and to continue on the work of service. Um, but the face is also changing, and how you guys can take up space in restaurants also is very different. Um, you don't have to work in terrible working conditions anymore. You have the right to choose, um, and you can make sure that you're being advocated for in those spaces. Um, I went to culinary school and worked in Italy for a really long time. And I had pans thrown at me. I had chefs yell at me. Um, a very, very old school type of way that at the time maybe worked or um, worked for a while. Um, but I think that we can be the next generation that can inspire folks to be um, more humane um, and more passionate and more intentional in how we take care of our people because at the end of the day, you work a lot, but we want to make sure that when you go to work that you are um, happy and, and um, that you can go home and still feel good about what you, what you do. Um, so that's what the TED Talk is about. It's only 15 minutes, so we can maybe watch it and fall asleep. But <laughs> um, yeah, that's just it. Oh, yeah, if you guys have any questions for me, how does the food taste? I hope it's good, yeah? Different in flavors is very different than the Filipino food that you traditionally would taste, but um, just wanted to give you guys a little different insight for what it is that we do. Oh, you have some questions. Oh, okay, pre-questions, okay. 
Uh, what is your signature dish? Because you showed a bunch oh, of your yeah. dishes there, yeah. Kare kare, signature dish, yeah. Uh, kare kare is our signature dish. If you've never had kare kare before, it is an oxtail stew made with peanut butter and baga ong, which is a fermented shrimp paste. Um, it is amazing and just savory and the flavors are so different than what you'd think of as Filipino food because there's no vinegar, there's no soy sauce, um, but it's just this hearty dish. Uh, we cook ours with short rib, um, so you get this super big short rib um, with okra and eggplant and green beans. Um, we started it as a weekly special and then uh, people were demanding it and then now we can't take it off the menu, but it's really good. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite dish to make? Oh my goodness. My favorite dish to make for myself? Yeah. I really like to make pasta. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just so simple. Um, whatever you have in your fridge, you know, even if you just have garlic, yeah. like garlic and some red chili flakes and a lemon is amazing. Um, anchovies with pasta Yummy. is really good, but that's usually like, I think as you find when you're cooking, it's hard to find time to cook for yourself or do big things. So pot of, pot of water and pasta is the way to go. Very good. Uh, okay, that leads to next. Your fav food when you're in Italy. Oh my gosh, my favorite food when I was in Italy. <laughs> that's so hard. Everything good. Huh? Everything is so good. I just was in Italy this last summer. Um, I got to go to Sicily. If you've watched The White Lotus, it's in Sicily. <laughs> um, but, oh my gosh, everything is so good. I, if I could just eat prosciutto and like wow, yeah. mortadella and cheese, that's what I'd eat. And bread. Mm. Nice. <laughs> I have to walk a lot, but <laughs> I'd do it. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, walking a lot. That leads to any advice to us or students uh, how you handle being on your feet for such Ooh, long hours? What some good. advice to them? Good. That's a good question. Uh, good shoes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good shoes are very important. Having multiple pairs of shoes are actually really important. You guys should change your shoes, um, you know, every couple of days to give your feet and your shoes rest. Um, high arches are great. Birkenstocks are great. Um, Don't ho look at mine. Yeah, hokas <laughs> are great. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've probably worn and tried every single shoe. Um, I wear like boots to work, which is because it's cold in Seattle. But um, that stretching, stretch. I don't know. We stretch in our kitchen, so we'll just tell the team right before service and everyone stretches together. Okay. Um, that's important. Okay. And sure. also just like what you put in your body and in your mind. You know what I mean? These are long hours. And like, if you can mentally clear your space and show up knowing what it is that you have to do, setting yourself up for that kind of success, you'll be able to really um, go further along because it doesn't feel like work anymore. You know, and then when you get home, Elevate your legs, you know, uh, try and do yoga if you can, that helps. Roll out your back, like all those things are what I do. <laughs> wow, that's busy. Uh, <laughs> uh, that leads into like, how can, um, what's, a, what's uh, some good points to how we can focus ourselves when we're cooking? Like um, when we're, you know, like we're losing focus. How can we get back to that? That's good. That's a really good question. Uh, I can't answer that either. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the biggest part uh, at the end of the day and what we talk with as a team is focus on self. So if you can create, center, focus yourself um, and give your space, like yourself time, right? So it's out outside of the kitchen, outside of your family, outside of whatever it is that you do and you give yourself time to just reflect, think, what did I do today? Was it great? Um, giving yourself affirmations of like, what did I do great today? What was challenging today, but what can I do better for tomorrow? But all in positive ways that give yourself grace. Those moments will allow you to show up in any space, not just work, with more focus and clarity because you've given yourself time to process that. 
if you try and work through and push through and just like go through, that's when your knife might slip and you might cut yourself. Or making sure that, you know, put that phone away and go to sleep. You mm. know, don't doom scroll, but like get some extra rest. Like I am, I might not look old, but I'm old. And <laughs> uh, I've learned all these things later on in life. Um, and like, I remember being young and like after work going out till five and then doing it all over again. And that doesn't have to be how you guys operate anymore. You know, rest is important and self care is important. Um, because if this is a long game, this is a really long game. You know, your chefs are here and we've been doing this for 20 plus years. Um, and if I had that advice when I was younger or just starting out, that was like, take time for yourself. I think that like, I'm grateful for where we are now, but like, maybe I'd be a little more ahead <laughs> than I am now. See, listen to your chef instructors, right? <laughs> yeah. um, in three words, how would you describe your philosophy behind your restaurant and oh, concept? Man. Three have to words. be three words, yeah. <laughs> Community driven, yeah, yeah, one. Yeah. Um, Amelia, that's Amelia over there. <laughs> Three words that describe, yeah, community driven, um, intentional, I think is one, and just like the balance, the importance of balance. So like being able to maintain what you do outside of work and how you show up to work. Um, Cause it's about them being able to, to do that. Um, and we love that, so. Um, I like this question here because I want, I want them to, uh, to listen to what you have to say about it. Did you experience any hardships being not only a woman but as a Filipino in the food industry? Mm. And if so, how did you work through those mm. barriers? That's good. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good question. Um, if you didn't hear the question, what hardships did I face as a Filipina, as a woman in this industry, and then how did I overcome them? This industry is not for the faint of heart, but um, the more people that can, um, hopefully other leaders or other chefs like myself, which are emerging and coming forth, that they can uh, give more opportunities to like not have it be how we came up. Um, I remember in New York one time I came in and I was gonna work and I was um, a line cook and I walked in and the whole kitchen was male. Um, and they were like, are you our new hostess? <laughs> and I just was like, oh my gosh, wow. And I was like, no, absolutely not. I'm here with you and I'm gonna grind with you and I'm gonna show you what I can do. And I think the part that's most difficult sometimes is like uh, there's that sense of like needing to prove yourself. Like when you step into those spaces, like I can do it just as much as you can um, by reminding yourself that you don't have to because um, at the end of the day, who you are and how you show up is going to be what gets you to the next place, right? If I had stayed in competition, if I had done all that every day with them, like my body would be broken. Um, when I decided to open Musang, I said everything that I experienced that was terrible, I would not have in my restaurant space. So there's no yelling, there's no like, um, there's just not that like toxic max masculinity which you've heard maybe that exists in restaurant spaces because there's no room for that. Um, we uplift you. If you made an error, it's not sorry, chef. It's what did you learn and what can you do next time? Um, because that can give you the courage and the ability to look at yourself and grow versus going back and like cowering back. You need to be able to develop who you are um, and through coaching and mentorship in that way, you can become like greater. And like, I think that's how I overcame my hardship because if you have chefs that are just like beating you down, like you're either gonna wanna like fight back <laughs> yeah. or you can take everything that you've learned and say, when I apply this, I'm just gonna show up with kindness and care. Um, and it will, it will pay off, I mean like, like I said, like we opened in 2020 and like my original team before the pandemic is still with me. And we've been able to continue to give them jobs. We've been given, like we give them healthcare, we give them 
401k, we, you know, we make sure that they only work four days a week and it might be 10 hours, but you get three days off, like, and being able to push that, you know, like I went from a time in Italy and New York where I worked 17 hours a day, eight, eight days a week, yeah, <laughs> felt like yeah. eight days a week, seven days a week. And, you know, when they say put in your time, most definitely put in your time, be respectful, learn what you can do and learn the craft but also put up your boundaries um, so that you can, and make it sustainable for yourself. Um, because you can find that workplace that respects you and treats you right, and then you can find that happiness within that. But it comes from here, because it's not always gonna be easy, but as long as you respect yourself and you're committed, um, you'll be able to see a lot of growth, I think. Yeah, I love that, because you know, we, tell, we tell our students, you, know, you have a choice of where you wanna work. Yeah, you don't want to work in a toxic place. You, every, you have a choice to, these days, you know, not yeah. back when. Yeah, it's awesome. Because um, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of people that are wanting to change. Um, yeah. And you can be part of that. Right. <laughs> uh, who's the first person you, uh, to show your culinary creations to? Oh, my God. I think, um, oh, my gosh. I have, I've always loved cooking. I think when I was a kid, like, you know, I'd cook Italian food with my mom. My dad's my biggest critic. And so um, even when he comes to the restaurant now, he'll like come in and taste food and then give me notes via text later. He won't even tell me to <laughs> That's <taste>. awesome. <laughs> he'll be like, JP's kind of salty today or Nate's like overcooking this, which is great. Um, but I don't know. I think uh, when I moved to Italy, I think that's where I gained and started to gain the confidence of what it is that I do. I think sometimes you have to go so far <laughs> to come back. I went so far and I like was like, ah, Filipino food, whatever. And it's like Italian food. And then my best friend in Italy was actually Filipina Italian. And her and I would create dishes, uh, Filipino food using Italian ingredients because we'd get so homesick. Um, and so we'd start playing around with little nuances of things that we could do. Adobo with red wine, um, artichoke hearts, in, uh, like using artichokes instead of banana leaves for, you know, whatever. But um, I think that's when we really started getting creative. Favorite ingredients to work with. Ooh. Yeah. There's this <laughs> seasoning salt called Johnny's seasoning <laughs> salt. Uh, it is a local seasoning salt. You can order it online. Um, but it's salt, garlic, paprika, black pepper. Um, we use it at the restaurant as our salt, um, uh -huh. but it is incredible. Um, I love seafood. Um, being from the Pacific Northwest, and you guys here, we have such great access to seafood. So um, any time that we can, in any different way, from grilled to fried to raw, um, I really love playing around with like textures and things that way. Uh, let's see, teaching philosophy to your cooks. Oh. What's your teaching philosophy? Lead by example. Uh, if I ask you to do something, it's probably that I've done it before, or I will do it with you. Um, you'll catch me in the dish pit. Uh, if my dishwasher calls out, I will dishwash. Um, and I think that there is an ability to show uh, camaraderie um, that you can and will get down with your team and you're in the trenches with them, but also that you can do the work if they have questions, because sometimes you will get questioned, you know, but then they're like, dang, Mel just worked a Friday night service in the dish pit with us. It gives them inspiration to be like, okay, that's the kind of leader that I want to be. Um, constantly asking questions. Um, constantly ask questions, guys. Constantly ask the why. Taste your food. Taste your food. Have a tasting spoon with you. Have tasting spoons with you. Um, that will give you an edge up in any place that you go to because you'll be able to show up with that knowledge that you know what food tastes like. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, those are like the three things that I tell my team all the time. Taste what you make, right? <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, your cooking philosophy. Um, oh, any good eateries you guys ate over here? Oh, you know? here? Yeah, are you guys just, oh. Come? okay. Oh my uh, god. Yeah, my, okay. I landed last so you're night. I'm going to probably eat at some good eateries <laughs> then, right? 
Um, but I'm going to plug my friend from LA. She's Filipina. She just moved here two days ago. She's taking over the Piggy Smalls place, oh. if you're familiar. Um, it's called uh, Peso, and it's going to be Filipino food. Um, so if you want to follow her on Instagram, um, Petite Peso or Ria Dolly, um, they're going to open up in March, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm really excited for them, and I'd be really excited to go check it out. I'm sure if you're interested in staging or working, they're going to be looking for people. Um, but they're just really incredible people that I'm excited to to see thrive and, and bring Filipino food in that way here. What about um, if you travel to Seattle? Yes. I was going to say, all you need to apply. Right yeah. Now. yeah. That's a great culture. Yes. Yeah. So where would you recommend them to go eat? Yes. Like, what's your favorite restaurant in Seattle? I love that. Um, Seattle's only five and a half hours away. <laughs> it's not that far. Uh, Musang, obviously, you guys should come to the restaurant <laughs> right. and eat. Um, and honestly, like Chef said, like whenever you guys finish here, if you ever are curious or want to come, like our house is open to you. Um, last year, we taught at KCC, and one of the students actually did their externship with us, um, Asuka, and we just met her like this, and she was with us for four months. Um, we're opening another restaurant in Seattle. Um, in May, uh, which is a little bit different concept, but still Filipino food. Um, I'd say Musang. Um, there's this place called Local Tide um, that so, like, focuses on food, seafood, uh, fresh fish, crab, really beautiful. Uh, Kamonegi is this Japanese restaurant. Soma is also a James Beard um, nominee. She makes her own soba. Um, there's videos also of her making soba on YouTube, or yeah, on YouTube, and it's just this really beautiful craft. Um, Maneki is the oldest Japanese restaurant. That's where I'd go. Um, but yeah, Seattle's beautiful. Like if you do get a chance, come visit. And whenever you do, like you can hit us up. Like our Instagram is Musang Seattle. My Instagram's Maltronica. Like you can, it's us that do everything um, from marketing to merch to food to all the things. Like we're open for you guys if you have questions or if you feel like you have hardships or whatever. Like we're here to answer those questions and be a resource for you guys. When transferring over to Italy, what were some obstacles that you had? Uh, the language, <laughs> for one. Um, I ended up going to school and being a nanny. So I nannied two little Italian boys while I went to school. Um, so my Italian, I ended up learning Italian pretty quickly. Um, the biggest obstacle is being like a woman that's not Italian in the kitchen. Um, being able to learn and earn respect um, was a huge obstacle, but work ethic is very, very important. And it's something that translates wherever you go. And it doesn't mean work ethic equals work more or work harder. It's how you show up um, and the dedication that you have. And that will, is like, you can, doesn't need a language, right? It's kind of an international language in itself. Um, visas are super difficult in Italy. Um, but you can go there for three months and, you know, find a place or there's places that you can just stage and work. Um, I recommend it, you know, not necessarily Italy, but anywhere. Um, being able to gain perspective in a different place gives you a lot of knowledge. Yeah. How did you know you're ready to open your own restaurant? I don't think you'll ever know <laughs> or ever be ready. Um, I never honestly thought that I was going to open a restaurant. Uh, when I first started cooking, um, I think I just was like, I'm going to cook. I'm going to be the best. Uh, but then once that switched over to what is my passion or what do I care most about, um, and it was Filipino food and sharing Filipino food, that we just did pop-ups. So I started Musang as a pop-up. We did that for, for three years, and we just popped up all over the city. Um, once a week, twice a week, brunches, late nights, etc. And then our community grew so large that it was like, 
I don't have an option. <laughs> he better open. Um, and we did, and the support has been incredible. Are there any opportunities you, that you wish you would have taken? I think everything in life, it sounds so corny, everything in life happens for a reason. Um, and not every journey is linear. So if you make a decision today and you feel like you might regret it tomorrow, just listen to your gut because you'll end up where you need to be. Like had I, you know, I, I came home to Seattle early from living in New York because I thought I was going to open a restaurant and I didn't. And then I ended up doing pop-ups and then I found what it was that I was really passionate for. I thought I wanted to stay in Italy, but that wasn't the case. Um, and I feel like what we've been able to build and create is far greater than anything I could have ever asked for. Um, but if the opportunity you feel like is missed, listen to your gut. You'll get to where you need to go. Was there a moment in your career where you just knew that this was what you want to do and this was the passion you wanted to follow? Because you said you transferred, or you also went to school oh, yeah. and also graduated with a Another degree? Yeah. Uh, so question was, okay, when did I know, I guess, that this is what I wanted to do, this is a passion? Uh, when I went to college, like, it was just I went to college because my parents wanted me to go to college, like a lot of our parents. Uh, my dad, to this day, will uh, tell me how much he spent on my college career and that I opened a restaurant. And then I'm like, but I opened the restaurant and I named it after you. Like, I don't know what, <laughs> what else you want. Uh, we recently did this like um, article for my for my college for my alma mater, and like he got a UW hat, <laughs> and he was like, "Finally, after all these years, I finally have something to show from all my yeah. <laughs> hard work." Um, I think sociology is a degree that has helped me, um, being able to work with people, communicate with people, understand people. I still think that what I do is social work. I work with people every day. I work with my team going through their problems, going through their successes, managing people. Uh, one thing they don't tell you about as a cook is that when you become a chef, now you have a lot of people that you are taking care of. Um, and there are a lot of children now that I have in my family. <laughs> um, I think that for me, I knew what it is that I wanted to do when I realized what we were doing was giving a platform for Filipinos um, to be proud of, to be seen. Um, the pop-ups were a way that were like affirming because we were like, we eat all this stuff at home. Our friends come over and eat this food, but like, why can't we have a restaurant or why aren't we saying that our food is good enough? Um, and I think for me, when I was like, our food is good enough, we can do this, that's when I was like, whatever it takes kind of thing. And um, it's just so important, you know, like I have a niece who's half Filipina um, and for so long she didn't even know she was Filipina and I was like heartbroken. And then I was like, we're gonna <laughs> learn how to cook Filipino food together and you're gonna know what it means. Um, and so for them to be able to see that, uh, I think is what makes everything that we do so important. Because it's not just me, it's like the team. And like, I'm, I'm speaking for Amelia who's here, but Amelia has two daughters. Um, Amelia is like our pastry chef admin, extraordinary human, she's right over there. Um, but just being able to have her daughters like have the opportunity to see us out here doing this. Uh, when they come into the restaurant, like when we were doing menu tasting, her daughter, her daughter Maya would um, write us notes of <laughs> critique <laughs> when she was like eight. <laughs> um, but for them to be able to experience that is what makes this all worth it. Awesome, yeah. Thank you, Chef, that was great Thank questions. You. So Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. and energy that Melissa shared with you today and Really, I hope it, she's inspired you as much as every time I hear you talk. It just really resonates from the heart what she's saying. And I hope that you all believe that you can be the difference, too, in the industry to do what she's doing, make that transformation. So thank you so much.
thank you thank you guys thank you come visit anytime <laughs> Thank you. Aw, thank you.